You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Welcome to the Federal Judicial Television Network. You won't find us in your weekly TV guide, and we haven't won any Emmys yet. But we think we can provide you with some interesting educational programs. This satellite broadcasting network is the result of cooperative efforts of the Federal Judicial Center, the Administrative Office of the United States Courts, and the United States Sentencing Commission. It links the federal judicial system into one interactive distance learning network. It will provide convenient and cost-effective education and information to judges and court personnel across the country. And it will help you share your good ideas and innovations with each other and with the center, the AO, and the commission. The center has experimented with satellite broadcasts since the 1980s, but to see those broadcasts, judges and court staff had to travel to places that had satellite antennas, be they on the other side of town or the other side of the state. In 1996, the center approached the AO and the Sentencing Commission about installing these antennas right on the federal courthouses. And together, the three agencies endorsed the concept of a court-wide television network. On the AO's recommendation, the Judicial Conference Executive Committee allocated funds to equip some 200 court locations with antennas, and the AO has seen to their installation in courthouses across the country. The network will allow the center to offer even more education for judges and court staff while preserving the face-to-face -face programs that are an essential part of the center's services to the judicial branch. It will bring you important and timely administrative office training about automation, financial management, <clears throat> and other operational matters. It will let the Sentencing Commission keep you up to date about the sentencing guidelines and let the Commission hear from you as it considers changes to the guidelines. <clears throat> The Center will continue to produce special video seminars about recent developments, such as panel discussions that review Supreme Court decisions of special interest to trial and appellate judges, or that assess how newly enacted legislation will affect the day-to-day -day work of the courts. In addition, all three agencies will present a new kind of program, interactive video teletraining. Teletraining will look a lot like regular classroom instruction and viewers will be able easily to send comments and questions back to the faculty directly from the courthouses. A newly constructed studio in the Thurgood Marshall Building is especially designed precisely for teletraining. The federal judicial system encompasses many courthouses and many people all over this large country of ours. The network will help us learn from colleagues in courts throughout the land and remind us that we are all part of one national court system. I am pleased to launch the Federal Judicial Television Network and to commend the Center, the Administrative Office, and the Sentencing Commission for bringing it together. Welcome to Evidence for the Trial Judge, a Federal Judicial Center program for United States District and Magistrate Judges. I'm Stephen Salzberg, Howard Chair of Trial Advocacy at the George Washington University Law School. 
As the accident reconstruction you've just seen demonstrates, computer-generated visual evidence can illustrate the events at issue in a case vividly and dramatically. But it can also give rise to some significant evidentiary issues. What criteria should you use in deciding whether to admit them into evidence? What are the authentication and fairness issues involved? What Daubert, hearsay, discovery, and case management considerations come into play? With me to discuss these issues are United States District Judge Fern Smith of the Northern District of California, who was the chair of the Judicial Conference Committee on the Federal Rules of Evidence, and Gregory Joseph, partner with Fried Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson in New York City, and chair of the American Bar Association's litigation section. Let's begin with a look at an actual tape that was computer generated and used in a federal district court in Texas. This tape involves the crash of Delta Flight 191. It was a terrible accident in which 137 people were killed, 128 passengers, eight crew members, and one person who was on the ground when the plane crashed. This was a case in which the passengers and their fa families of the passengers sued, in which the families of two of the crew members sued, and in the end, the airline claimed that the United States was ultimately responsible for the accident because of its failure to warn about weather conditions. And the film that we are about to see was an exhibit that was offered at the trial on behalf of the United States. Judge Smith, this was a bench trial in Texas, and the district judge admitted the video that we've just seen in evidence. Um, is it more likely in a bench trial that you'd be willing to receive a tape like this without really regard to the prejudice concerns that might worry you in a jury case? Oh, I think it's far more likely, and I have to say that especially in, in a tape like this. I've heard this particular tape a number of times and I've heard other tapes, seen other tapes involving uh, aircraft accidents. And uh, while I find the underlying uh, evidence and data to be quite reliable uh, most of the time and admissible, I think, for example, allowing the voices of the actual crew to be heard is a very difficult issue. And from a personal standpoint, I would be most unlikely to allow that in where there's a jury trial. It's hard enough to listen to when you've heard it a number of times, but I think the impact on a lay jury who's never heard this before could be dramatic. Greg, let me ask you a question. Suppose you're the lawyer who is representing the United States and you're thinking about using a tape like the one we've just seen. At what point in the discovery process? At what point in the pretrial process do you believe that such a tape has to be disclosed to the other side so that the other side has an opportunity to raise objections? Well, Steve, the manual for complex litigation has for years said that this sort of computer-generated evidence ought to be disclosed well in advance of trial in ordinary discovery. But right now, under Rule 26, the mandatory expert report 
that's in force in the jurisdictions that have the 93 rules requires that any exhibit that's being used with an expert be disclosed at the time the expert report is filed. Now, the way the rules operate, there's actually some latitude there because under Rule 26E1, you're able to complement or supplement that report later up through the time of the pretrial order. But, Judge Smith, you tell me if the, something like that were to be introduced, even within the confines of Rule 26E1, on the last day, the day the pretrial order is due, even if it does nothing but illustrate what the expert said in his or her deposition, do you think that might be a bit prejudicial to the other side? Oh, extremely so. And, and let me say first, because I think uh, full disclosure demands that I give my own particular bias, but I'm a strong believer in 20, Rule 26 when it comes to experts, and so I tend to adhere uh, fairly strictly to that. But I think when you have something like this, which is so critical and so powerful, that uh, fairness requires that this be disclosed well in advance of the last pretrial. For example, I often have the last pretrial two or three weeks before the trial. It does the other side virtually no good at all. I think fairness requires that it be disclosed before the expert uh, of the proffering side is deposed. I think it must be disclosed before your own expert, the, the opposing side's expert, is disclosed so that he or she can respond and take it into account. Uh, and I think that um, as a, bringing it up the last day of the pretrial would simply not suffice. Well, Steve, you know, I mean, that, that raises the authentication issues when you're dealing with something like this because, as Judge Smith is reflecting, you've got what the expert may say orally on the stand or at his or her deposition. And then you've got the separate authentication issues that relate specifically to the computer-generated animation itself. What authentication issues do you think would have to be dealt with before this kind, of, assuming there's an objection, before this kind of video could be introduced? At one level, it makes a difference what this is being introduced for. Now, that's highly impactful, if that's a word, no matter what the ostensible use is. If you have an animation that's being offered purely for illustrative purposes, purely to visualize what an expert says, ordinarily the standards for admissibility are more lax. And they're more relaxed because that doesn't go into the jury room necessarily, and it's only to demonstrate what somebody is saying rather than to recreate an accident. Now, as you know, Steve, in that particular case, that was offered for the truth. That was actually offered into evidence. And for that, you'd need to show both that the underlying theory of the expert satisfied the Daubert standard under Rule 702, and that the way that theory was put into a formula and translated into an animation separately satisfied the Daubert test, because that itself would be expert evidence. Judge Smith, let me ask you if, assuming there's an objection, and the objection is that this um, tape actually is unnecessary, and let me spell this out a little bit. It's, uh, having watched it and having looked at the opinion of the district judge, it seems as though this is a case in which the parties agreed that weather conditions was caused this plane to crash. Um, the United States theory was the weather conditions should have been on radar, the pilot should have seen them, they should have aborted this landing, and there was pilot error, and that's ultimately what the district court found caused the accident. The plane, the Delta's theory was that the United States was responsible, its negligence caused the accident. Do you think, having watched this tape, that it actually assists very much in telling us uh, whose fault the accident was? Well, I think it certainly <coughs> excuse me, illustrates certain things. For example, it does illustrate what the crew is saying. And it's certainly possible and conceivable in this type of a tape that the, the crew's discussion of what is going on, what they were aware of, how soon they know about it, is very valuable information. So I don't have uh, a problem with that part of it. But let me, let me go back, if I can, Steve, to what Greg said a few minutes ago about the difference between illustrative purposes and, and substantive evidence. I'm not sure that in a tape like this, if it's a jury case, that a judge should simply listen to the lawyer who says, oh, well, it's only going in for illustrative purposes. I think that juries today are highly impacted by visual evidence. It's the world of television, movies, people are used to seeing their news on television. It has 
a sense of reality that I think um, paper documents or even verbal testimony simply don't have. So I think when you've got this kind of a, um, a computer-generated uh, aid that is so dramatic that even if it's allegedly coming in for illustrative purposes, the trial judge has a high degree of duty to look at it carefully. Let's go back to that, Greg, this illustrative purpose. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great lawyer's term, and it usually means that when you say illustrative purpose, you want the trial judge to drop her guard a little bit because you're saying, Judge, this is not really as important as substantive evidence. But in a case like the one we've just seen, isn't it true that an expert's opinion as to the cause of the accident would be offered for its truth? It would be substantive evidence, correct? Absolutely. And this tape we've seen is really nothing more than a visualization of an expert's opinion, isn't it? It's correct. So that the line between illustrative evidence, as Judge Smith said, and substantive evidence really is elusive in, in this kind of setting, don't you think? I think that's very true, and I think there are a number of cases that agree with Judge Smith on that very point, that you can't use as a subterfuge the rubric that it's only being offered for illustrative purposes. But to go back, Steve, to the analysis you made, it would also be true that if they were to take uh, the key sentence of the expert's opinion and write it on the blackboard, that would go directly to the heart of what that is, yet it would remain illustrative evidence. Suppose, if I can stay with you for a second, suppose you're the lawyer who has decided that you want to use a, a tape like the one we've seen, and I'm the opposing counsel. And um, suppose I um, say, when you tell me you want to use this kind of tape, I want in discovery. I want to get the software that you've used to generate it. I want to get the data that you use to input um, to generate this tape. And I want to basically see if I can replicate and if I can, by changing some of the assumptions, generate um, different images. Um, do you fight me in discovery about disclosure? The truth of the matter is, is if I really want to get this in, I don't think it's wise to be fighting that kind of disclosure because you've made it more difficult for the other side to probe the truth and given them an argument to present to Judge Smith or the presiding judicial officer as to why it ought not come in. The principal argument that you hear is an argument that whatever software was begun with, it has been made proprietary by the addition of theories of the entity that's created the tape. I find that unpersuasive under Rule 26, not only because of the expert report rule, but because in Rule 26A, the last segment of that rule says that all other discovery still remains available regardless of mandatory disclosure. So I do believe that that is something which is required. I think that's why the Manual for Complex Litigation has said so for more than a decade. It's why the civil trial practice standards of the ABA would call for it in the same setting. Judge Smith, suppose we had a lawyer who was less reasonable than Greg <laughs> Joseph and asserted that this was proprietary, that it was a secret, that it was something that the expert had generated and the expert didn't want to disclose the details. Uh, would you require the disclosure? Absolutely. Um, I think proprietary claims end when you list someone as an expert. If you want it to remain a secret, then keep that person as a consultant. But one of the big concerns uh, among trial judges these days on computer-generated evidence is fairness. And what you often find are cases in which <clears throat> one side uh, is far more um, able to spend the kind of money that some of these things take. Now, I don't think it's fair to say that the side with more money needs to pay for the other side to go out and do the same thing. But it seems to me a valid compromise and a way to balance things out is to say, fine, if you want to do this, that's okay, but you've at least got to make these underlying um, bits of information available just the way you would an expert's notes in a less sophisticated issue. It's all the same thing as far as I'm concerned. And you know, this really suggests that in a standard pretrial order, one of the things that might be mentioned would be animations or computer-generated evidence so that the issue could mm -hmm. be flagged relatively early and could be made part of the pretrial order and these issues could be addressed since oftentimes there will be a motion in limine in any event. You might as well get it addressed up front so that that can proceed in an orderly fashion. That's a good suggestion. In fact, um, one of the first trials I had involved a recreation of a shooting, and the uh, plaintiff unfortunately didn't object to it until the day of the pretrial, although the plaintiff had been given a copy of it several months before. And I let it in 
partly because I found it was a fair representation, but also because the objection had been made too late, in my opinion, and was no longer fair. But I think putting as much as you can in your standard pretrial orders and things would lessen the chance of that happening. And that's a great suggestion, Greg. Greg, let me ask you a question about cost. At one time, uh, some of the computer-generated exhibits that we um, have seen offered really cost a ton of money. And it was only the big case, and often only the wealthy uh, litigant who could afford to do it. My impression is that the cost of producing something like we just saw, Delta 191, have been dropping dramatically and make these kinds of exhibits available to more litigants. Is that right? That's absolutely right. Z-Axis is the name of the company that produced the particular tape we saw. And by virtue of the kind of case that was, that would still remain a relatively expensive tape. It has to be pristine in all respects. But there are a lot of kinds of cases in which there's almost off-the-shelf software for a simple car accident, which can be adjusted to take into account the particular facts of the case. And these can be done for, in some cases, a few thousand dollars. In some cases, it'll still be six figures to put these things together. Judge Smith, if a litigant came before you uh, with a video like we've seen, or maybe a different case, an automobile accident case, mm -hmm. and, and there was an objection to the video, and the objection was, Judge, it's too costly. We can't afford this. And the litigant who prepared it said, Judge, it really cost under $10,000. We have the package here. We'd be happy to share the cost of this package. If they want to pay half of it, they can generate their own. Would that make a difference in how you think about this? Well, I think that would be a nice solution, and I'm always happy to hear reasonable suggestions. But let, let me talk about that whole philosophical issue, because I think it's an important one. Typically, when this imbalance occurs, or more certainly more often than not, it's the d defendant who has the resources and the plaintiff who doesn't. From a personal standpoint, and, and to maybe to play the devil's advocate in some way, I think there's something unfair about a defendant being hailed into court and then being told that he, she, or it can't spend what resources are available to defend oneself. Um, and so I think that the, the middle ground is simply to try to make the playing field reasonably level without asking one side to pick up the cost. Cost sharing is one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to simply order that a copy of the exhibit be made for the other side at the other side's expense. And then the other side has time and can hire an expert to merely comment on the, the faults of the exhibit, the weaknesses of the exhibit, or to give another version of how the exhibit might be interpreted. And Steve, the reason that becomes important, since you raised earlier the question of authentication, is that when you get the exhibit and all the underlying software, apart from the expert evidence questions about the expert's theory and whether it's been translated properly, there are a series of other possible issues as to authentication. All the data may not have been input properly, there may be, apart from the particular program, other processing questions. There are whole checklists of things that one can go through, and you'd want to have that all eliminated in advance of trial or at least teed up on a motion to eliminate. There are also basic hearsay questions. On uh, certain, most tapes, somebody's got to input the data. And that itself is an act, an, an act of verbal or nonverbal expression, which is a hearsay act, so that has to be addressed if there's any genuine issue as to trustworthiness. So there are a lot of issues, and you want to get those out of the way in advance of trial so as not to slow things down. Let's suppose, Judge Smith, that we have a motion to eliminate. Greg Joseph has made a motion to exclude a tape like the one we've just seen. And you've taken this up because you want it resolved before the trial mm -hmm. begins. And you've decided, let's suppose, that you're going to let this tape in. Maybe you're going to exclude some of the voice, but you're going to let most of the tape in. And the question is, in this particular case, it was the United States exhibit. It's a defendant. Um, can a lawyer for the United States stand up in an opening statement and use the video as part of the opening statement in order to have the most powerful presentation possible? Well, you can certainly try. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always a little leery about which exhibits get used in opening statements, even if I know that eventually they're going to come in. Uh, my guess at this point is that I would probably allow the tape but limit the government or whomever was proffering it to using it once on the grounds that I think some exhibits are so powerful that um, 
one one time around is enough. Uh, but you really, I think, have to look at these things on a case-by-case -case situation and decide how powerful are they, how much time do they take, uh, if they're going to come in, is there harm, uh, is the other side objecting, or does the other side have an equally powerful exhibit that it wants to use. So all of those things have to be taken into consideration. If one side only has a, um, an exhibit like the one we've seen, and it uses it with, mm -hmm. because you've, you've permitted it, and suppose it's marked and it's offered into evidence, will you admit it and send it to the jury room with the other exhibits? Highly unlikely, again. Um, it depends on how powerful I think it is. I'd be worried about the jury playing it over and over again and having it assume more importance than other exhibits. But again, I think you have to, to look at all of the, these things on an individual basis. I am always leery of videotaped evidence of any kind going into the jury room. What about on final argument, Judge? If this has been admitted, you've said they could play it once during trial. Fair game to play it again in closing? Well, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. parts of it. But again, I think you really have to take it case by case. If each side had a video, there's less reason to prevent it than if one side. Uh, if one side has the video and, it, and wants to use it in, in uh, closing argument, then I think if the other side would like to use favorable segments of it, I would or order the proffering side to allow the other side to use it so that all of those possibilities exist and I think you simply have to look at each case as it comes along. And I assume also when we're talking about the kind of limitations you're talking about, it relates to the fact that what we've seen is a reconstruction under whatever name. Absolutely. And that a, a computer generated animation that may simply be a tutorial of some kind would be subject to fewer restrictions. That's correct. And, and maybe this is a good time to mention as well the role of limiting instructions by the judge which, which I think become critical in a case like this, especially if you're talking about reconst reconstruction or recreations. I think whenever the tape is used, whether it's an opening statement in the body of the case or in closing argument, a judge must keep reminding the jury always of exactly what it is and that it is a recreation or a reconstruction, reminding them about assumptions, uh, going through the whole litany of whatever weaknesses or problems there may be and trying to keep the jury focused on those possibilities. Well, you've actually, I think, brought us right to the point where, Greg, we have a, a video that we're about to show. It's a patent case. And I would think, wouldn't you, that patent cases are cases in which somehow or other both litigants are going to have to describe for the jury often highly technical material um, and show how devices and inventions, um, how they work. And that videos may be actually more effective in doing this than creating a physical exhibit that the way we used to have to because we didn't have this alternative. I agree, Steve. This gives you the opportunity to compact and condense a great deal of information into a relatively short time period. It saves time and trouble for the court, for the jury in different kinds of cases in learning what this is all about. And the next example that we've got is an excellent one because talking about this isn't nearly as helpful as actually seeing the spray nozzle device work. Well, Judge, here's what we're going to do since I think you really did bring us right up to where we need to be. We're going to show this video. Um, you've seen it, and Greg has seen it, and I've seen it. And what we all three know is that this was actually filmed without sound. And had it been longer, none of us would have been awake when it ended. So since we're going to show this as part of um, our little show here, we're going to ask Greg to tell us about this tape as we see it so that our hope is the judges and who watch this, you know, will still be awake mm -hmm. when we continue our discussion. Yeah. Well, that, that, of course, is the nature of patent cases. But this particular <laughs> patent case uh, has a video that's prepared by Z-Axis. And what the issue is is infringement. This is prepared on behalf of the defendant in an infringement action. And that colorful key is the critical component that's the challenge of the case. And it descends and fits tightly over a very small ball, which is not visible until we've done a cutaway. 
And as you'll see, it's that very tiny yellow ball or white ball in the center of the screen. Uh, the key comes down, and when manually rotated, it cleans the ball, and the various yellow arrows that you'll be seeing go around the ball show the force of paint as it's being atomized and sprayed through the nozzle uh, going around the ball, and that itself is creating a natural seal, preventing dripping, and maintaining cleanliness. And you're seeing this in three segments. First we saw just the key, then we've done a cutaway that's gotten us to the entire device, and now we're descending through that to see some of the various mechanical aspects. And I think that the trial lawyers did what may be most effective here in deciding not to have a pre-prepared audio narration, but to be able to walk through this where they have the ability to stop at any frame and have the expert explain to the judge, since it's a patent case, I believe this was a patent case since it was infringement tried to a court, uh, and have that person walk through each issue. And therefore, if there are any questions from the fact finder, he or she could ask the questions and have them explained. That's something which a pre-prepared audio narration doesn't necessarily help you with because then you've tried to anticipate questions and if anything wasn't answered or if anything is missed, you're going to have to stop afterwards, try and recreate what the question is if the fact finder still has it in mind. And that raises the issue that Judge Smith you mentioned earlier, namely that if there is some part of an audio narration or even a visual depiction that the court deems inadmissible, that can be eliminated and the rest of it shown. Absolutely. I mean, there's no reason you can't redact a computer-generated bit of evidence the same way you can redact a documentary piece of evidence and take out the parts that you simply decide aren't admissible. This seems to me to be a really good example of a video that is probably the best of the alternative ways of showing how a device mm -hmm. works. Would, does that make sense? I, I would agree. This is, um, in a sense, the opposite end of the scale from the airline video. There's nothing here inflammatory, shocking, whatever. And uh, as you two have alluded to, the, the big trick is to keep everybody awake in some of these cases and paying attention. But this is a perfect example of something that, in a brief, fairly brief time, can explain graphically and succinctly how something works, assuming it's accompanied by an appropriate narration. It's e that's easy to do, and I would think that uh, even a party with very little money could simply use an engineer from the firm. You can use the foreman. You can use uh, virtually anybody who understands how the part works to simply stand there as you go through and uh, narrate as you're being shown this film clip. Greg, am I right that actually one of the reasons this was made was because the lawyers had trouble trying to do a physical exhibit? I'm told that in fact the model kept breaking down when they tried to do the demonstration in a way that would let you see what was happening mm -hmm. on the inside. It also demonstrates, since it's a patent case, the need for these when you're dealing with objects which aren't visible. Often we're in an electronic age, we're dealing with microchips right. and microchip technology. I know in San Francisco you see a lot of those we cases. Do and you can't see it, you're going to have to blow it up in some fashion mm -hmm. and there will be a much greater expenditure of time trying to go through a series of images slowly one by one and then trying to create an action theme. Absolutely. In fact, I if, if I could add to that, another um, very helpful use for things of this sort in patent cases are at the motion for summary judgment level. I have some cases in which the parties have made um, films like this showing a process of manufacturing or the way a part makes and have used them to assist me in determining, uh, for example, Markman issues um, or uh, summary judgment issues. And so they can come in and be helpful to the trier effect in a variety of ways and at very different sequences along the litigation process. I'm going to go back to a question I asked you earlier mm -hmm. and see whether the ruling changes. Okay. And that is My rulings often do. <laughs> I'm changing the, just change the facts a little bit here. If I were the, um, the lawyer who had done this tape, mm -hmm. and this were a jury trial, more patent cases are being tried to juries, I think. Well, if they get that far. If they get that far. <laughs> I would say to you, Judge, if I can show this video in my opening statement, it's going to make everything understandable. Mm -hmm. And my guess is you'd say this is a different kind of case 
and, and showing it twice would not really raise the concerns about prejudice or unfairness that we we talked about earlier. Am I, I right? You're absolutely right, because this is not subject to the kind of 403 concerns that the plane crash has. This is purely documentary to me. It's no different, really, than if in an opening statement someone used some big charts, diagrams, schematics to show a particular product, except that this is quicker and easier to understand. So you're absolutely right. And in that regard, because this is being used purely to visualize someone's testimony, does it really matter that it happened to be computer generated if the expert says this is really what it looks like and what it really does? I don't see why that makes a difference any more than having a good graphic designer sketching a sequence of charts that shows what happens in the in the various steps. This really, when you come down to it, a video like this, a, a, a piece of evidence like this, is really no more than multiple slides put together so that they they move quickly. And that really does emphasize how the 403 considerations and the potential prejudice does impact the analysis on admissibility because as, a, as an analytical matter, when you don't have that 403 issue, the authentication issues are not really salient except the ultimate conclusion, is it a fair and accurate portrayal? I think that's right. This actually builds on, this video we've seen builds in a surprising way on the Supreme Court's decision this was last term in the old chief case where Justice Souter said that one of the things that a judge ought to consider is when ruling on probative value versus prejudicial effect is what the other evidence available is. And I think we all agree, and when you watch this, this is probably the most probative piece of evidence, the least time-consuming way to do this. And that if you compare it and you say, how else would we do it, we'd always be falling back on, a, on something similar but mm -hmm. less effective. I think that's correct. Um, that completes our program for today. On behalf of the Federal Judicial Center, I'd like to thank Judge Smith and Gregory Joseph for being with us today, and also thank you for watching. Last but not least, we hope you'll take a moment to fill out the program evaluation form in your materials, as your feedback is important to us and plays an important role in the design of these programs. Thanks again, and good day.